The collection of the Queensland Maritime Museum in Brisbane includes a remarkable exhibit, Frigate HMAS Diamantina. This humble ship can be rightly called a unique monument to an important part of the world's naval history. That's because she is the last remaining representative of the river-class ships, which became famous for their contribution to the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. On September the 3rd, 1939, several hours after Great Britain had declared war on Germany, a German U-boat sank the British cruise liner Athenia. Two weeks later, aircraft carrier HMS Courageous was torpedoed. Thus began the battle for the Atlantic. It was mainly fought between German U-boats, Allied transport convoys and their escorting ships. The escorts that they were using at that stage for the convoys were small destroyers, mostly left over from World War I, and very small corvettes and sloops. These older warships uh, were unable to handle the conditions of the North Atlantic, both uh, weather-wise, but also did not have the endurance to be able to escort a convoy all the way across the Atlantic from Great Britain to the east coast of the United States. At the beginning of the war, the convoys carrying vital supplies to Great Britain sailed from the USA and Canada virtually unprotected and very often fell prey to German U-boats. Only in the 200-mile area near the British Isles, the so-called Western Approaches, screening ships met the convoys and escorted them to British ports. They needed a ship built especially for the sole purpose of protecting transport convoys. This type of ship wouldn't bombard coastal defenses or fight against enemy surface targets. It would only engage German U-boats and protect transports in a convoy. It wasn't long before a project was developed that met all the requirements. The ship had a great cruising range and was so different from the vessels that usually escorted convoys that the Admiralty brought back a term from the era of sailing ships, the frigate. As the majority of ships were named after British rivers, the entire series became known as the River Class. The River Class project had an important advantage. The ships could be constructed by both specialized military shipyards and civil shipbuilding enterprises. Specifications of the River Class frigate HMAS Diamantina. Length, almost 92 meters. Beam, more than 11 meters. Draft, 4 meters. Displacement, 2,200 tons. Armament. Primary armament, two dual-purpose 102mm Mark 16 guns, anti-aircraft artillery, three Bofors guns, caliber 40mm, four Ehrlichon guns, caliber 20mm, anti-submarine armament, four depth charge rails and 150 depth charges in storage. The main power plant consisted of two triple expansion steam engines that produced 5,500 horsepower. Maximum speed, 20 knots. Cruising range, more than 5,000 miles at 12 knots. The initial actions of German submarines were mostly individual. They acted on their own. But when convoy protection was reinforced, when the Allies constructed many special ships to escort transports, the Germans had to invent a way to overcome their defenses. That's when they devised the so-called wolf pack tactic. It worked like this. A U-boat discovers a convoy. The flagship that commands a wolf pack or a system of wolf packs transmits the order to other U-boats to move to that area. And those U-boats start to gather to intercept the convoy. Lots of them. Diamantina was fitted with a Type 271 radar, which actually played a pivotal role in changing the course of World War II. The Britons had 
um, developed what was known as the greatest secret of World War II, which was the cavity magnetron. And the cavity magnetron is at the heart of this Type 271 radar. Its major role in the protection of convoys was its ability at night to detect the submarines on the surface as they approached the convoy to attack the convoy. And the Germans were unaware that the escorts were fitted with radar and were able to see or detect the submarines as they were making their uh, approach to, uh, to make their attack. The radar could only detect a submarine if it was on the surface. But they usually surfaced just prior to an attack. Unfortunately, warships in World War II were unable to detect uh, torpedoes that had been fired and they relied entirely on uh, lookouts picking up the track of the torpedo uh, as it approached the ships and uh, because of the propulsion system used by most of the torpedoes they could see a line of bubbles coming to the surface. Well I can only relate a training experience when Murchison was exercising with British submarines and I was given the task of looking for the torpedo bubbles but when I sighted the bubbles, and by the time I reported them to the captain, the bubbles are now on the other side of the ship. So uh, his words to me were, signalman, if this was a real war situation, we would be now manning the lifeboats. Even if a ship managed to dodge torpedoes, thanks to the vigilance of signalmen, it was difficult to retaliate because the submarine swiftly disappeared from sight. Having launched torpedoes, submarines dived and they could only be discovered with the help of a special device, sonar. Near the bow of the ship, just close behind us here is a black dome and that is the sonar dome fitted to these ships. And the sonar is a bit like a torch beam which is projecting a sound signal out into the water and hoping to get a reflection back of something like a submarine. And that uh, sonar equipment is uh, directional and so where it's pointing, where it's looking, uh, where it's sending the beam out is under the control of the operator. And that was one of the vital sensors of the, that these ships had for detecting submarines. A frigate's captain had to deal with the shortcoming of sonar when planning a counterattack against a submarine. It lost contact with the target at a distance of about 140 meters. Thus, the captain had to guess the possible course of the submarine and direct his ship straight towards it. Under the conditions of an intense battle, decisions had to be made in mere seconds, and controlling the maneuverable frigate required some skill especially in rough seas. Interesting things about here is that the helmsman who is steering the ship is actually unable to see where we're going. And that's fairly typical of British warships of the uh, Second World War. Orders come down to the helmsman from the bridge deck above us where the captain or the officer of the watch is actually uh, giving the instructions for steering the ship and also for giving the engine orders here through the telegraphs which are then down to the engine room to change the ship's speed. I'm seated in the captain's day cabin aboard the frigate Diamantina. And these ships were very unique because they incorporated a major design uh, feature that brought the whole ship's company into the middle section of the ship, close to where we are now. However, when the Battle of the Atlantic started and the destroyers were operating in the very rough conditions in the North Atlantic, the British Navy was losing officers swept over the side when they were moving from their accommodation in the after section of the ship to try and get to the bridge across the upper decks. There was no way through the engineering spaces to get to the forward part of the ship. And so when they came to the design of these ships, the British realised that they needed to move the officers into the forward section of the ship, which is where we are today. At the end of April 1943, 
After a week's storm-filled cruise, convoy ONS-5 was intercepted by a wolf pack. The convoy's screening ships, including several river-class frigates, repelled the attacks of about 40 submarines for several days. 13 transports were sunk. The German submarines had the advantage until the fifth day of battle, when the convoy entered a stripe of dense fog. In a single moment, hunters became prey, betrayed by the bright markings on radar screens of escorting ships. In the impenetrable haze, the British frigates competently found German U-boats and attacked them. For combat against the a submerged submarine, the ship carried uh, over 100 depth charges in its uh, depth charge magazine. And these were large cylinders full of explosives that they would either roll off the stern or launch out from the side of the ship in a pattern uh, set at different depths to try and uh, explode around the submarine and close to the submarine and either to crush the submarine or force the submarine back to the surface. There were two ways to drop depth charges on river class frigates. From rails on the aft and with the help of K-gun throwers installed on the ship's sides. The simultaneous use of these two methods increased the effective area and probability of damaging a submarine. The Hedgehog mortar launcher was another anti-submarine weapon of the river class. It fired 24 30 kilogram bombs ahead of a ship. A salvo from a Hedgehog covered an area of more than 30 meters in diameter. The system was effective, but unreliable at first. That's why depth charges remained the primary anti-submarine weapon of river-class frigates. However, escorting ships had to engage submarines in artillery duels quite often as well. These four-inch guns on Diamantina were all mechanically operated, so they had men manning the elevation and men manning the training of the weapon, and there were no inputs from other sources, such as a gun director, which you would find on the larger warships. And so these were all in local control. They would target and engage the, the uh, enemy uh, unit to, from this uh, weapon under di verbal direction from the gunnery officer who was on the bridge. At the time when, in the Northern Hemisphere, the grandiose battle for the Atlantic reached its turning point, Walker's Limited Shipyard in Maryborough, Australia, laid down frigate HMAS Diamantina. By the moment of her launch, the Atlantic was basically clear of German submarines, thanks in no small part to British river-class frigates. Now their Australian sister-in-arms was to participate in the final act of World War II. The frigate was commissioned in April 1945. Diamantina took part in operations against Japanese troops in New Guinea, near Solomon Islands, and Bougainville Island. Diamantina has, in my mind, three claims to fame. First of all, she is the last Australian warship to fire a shot at the Japanese in the Second World War. The second claim to fame was that the Japanese garrison at the islands of Nauru and Ocean Island in the Pacific actually surrendered on the quarterdeck of this ship. And the third claim is that she's the last in the world of this class of ship. After World War II, river-class frigates continued to serve in the navies of 20 countries for several decades. In 1959, Diamantina was re-equipped 
as an oceanographic survey ship. Her contribution to the study of ocean depths was acknowledged when a fracture zone in the Indian Ocean was named after her. In the 1980s, the ship was honorably decommissioned and placed in a comfortable dry dock at Queensland Maritime Museum in Brisbane. Now the bright Australian sun warms the deck of the last ship from the river class, a family of small ships that struck terror into German wolf packs in the northern Atlantic. <laughs>